and thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 377, Iceland, a peaceful invasion. Despite what flat earthers think, the world is a globe, a sphere, and this is important when it comes to sailing between two points that are far away from each other. Before the U.S. came into the war, it was supplying Britain with all kinds of foods and materiel, and this was transported to Scotland, far away from the actual shooting. What's more, when the Soviet Union enters the war, the convoys will find themselves having to travel to Murmansk in northern Russia by sailing past Norway, and the paths or routes these ships took had them sailing close to Iceland. So close, London began to worry, would Iceland become a target of the Axis? At the time, Iceland had a personal union with Denmark. That is, they shared the same monarch, but Iceland had been independent since 1918. However, the Althing, Iceland's parliament, did ask Denmark to carry out on its behalf many defensive and foreign affairs issues. But that agreement would be shattered when Nazi Germany invaded Denmark on April 9, 1940. And as the latter had no real army ready to go, the occupation was over quickly. Before this, Denmark, its possessions, and Iceland had declared their neutrality, but time would show no one was going to be allowed to sit this one out, except Switzerland, and that was a fluke. Going back into the midst of time, a Norwegian named Nad Dodd, or Nadador, was the first Norseman to set foot on Iceland. This was in the 9th century. He called the island before him Snowland. You know, because it was snowing. Then a Swede came along and looked at the place and named it after himself. Typical. Next came a Viking, Floki. But his daughter had died on the way. His animals had starved to death once he arrived. So, rather dejectedly, Floki called the place Iceland. And it stuck. Eventually, others would come, Scots and Irish, looking for a fresh start. By 930 AD, most of the best land on Iceland was taken. Hence, the alt thing, or legislative body, was established. Oh, as more people came, but there was no land available, some of them moved to Greenland and started a settlement there in 986. The next part is predictable enough. More people showed up, nobles came along or were made, and soon local chieftains were vying for power. There was a lot of tension, but this was laid low as the Old Covenant was signed in 1262, placing the island under the Norwegian crown. This lasts until 1397, then came a union between the kingdoms of Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. They were unified. But this comes to an end in 1524. Now Iceland belongs to Denmark and Norway. Next in Iceland's future is the plague. Religious persecution, pirates, a smallpox epidemic, and volcanic eruptions. But overall, Denmark is in control until 1847, when Iceland was granted a constitution and home rule. Which brings us back to the Danish-Icelandic Act of Union in 1918, which was to be valid for 25 years. Berlin, though, decided back on December 17, 1939, that Denmark was to be invaded and occupied. And again, it was on April 9th, 1940. But, relatively speaking, the occupation was not as brutal as it would be in other places. The king and government continued to function, that is, until August of 1943, when Germany placed the country under a direct military rule. For the record, some 3,000 Danes of Denmark died from the occupation. Another 2,000 Danes died volunteering fighting alongside the Nazis on the Eastern Front, and just over 1,000 Danes volunteered for the Allied Navy. When war came to Europe, Britain, in seeking to weaken Germany, put strict export controls on Iceland. No reason to help the enemy when they were so far ahead in the militarization of their country and economy. To compensate for this move, London offered Reykjavik assistance of all kinds, economic, materiel. They wanted a relationship with Iceland, one that was a belligerent and as an ally. But the islanders wanted to stay neutral. Yet what London could not ignore was the German presence on the island. 
at the very least, they had to be gathering information about the ships heading towards Scotland and the weather. London was nervous. Something had to give. But all rules for observing the niceties disappeared when Germany invaded Denmark on April 9, 1940, during Operation Wesserubung. Norway was also invaded. With all pretense removed, London, on that same day, sent a message to Reykjavik, saying, Let us help you stay independent, but we will need facilities on the island to make this happen. To this, the Althing, or Parliament of Iceland, said no, further declaring that Danish King Christian X was no longer able to perform his constitutional duties, hence all responsibility would go to Iceland's government. This was on April 10, 1940. The British did not hesitate with their next move. About 320 kilometers, or 200 miles north by northwest from the northern tip of Scotland, sits the archipelago of the Faroe Islands, putting it roughly halfway between Scotland and Iceland, though not in a direct line. At the time, the islands were considered an amt, or county, of Denmark. Just after the Germans walked into Denmark, the British launched Operation Valentine, the occupation of the Faroe Islands. Days later, Churchill, the First Lord of the Admiralty at the time, told the House of Commons, We are also at this moment occupying the Faroe Islands, which belong to Denmark and which are a strategic point of high importance, and those people showed every disposition to receive us with warm regard. We shall shield the Faroe Islands from all the severities of war and establish ourselves there conveniently by sea and air until the moment comes when they will be handed back to Denmark. On April 12th, two British destroyers entered the capital's harbor. The island's parliament met, and later that day, the occupation was announced, followed by the new rules in regards to censorship, using cars at night, and, of course, the ubiquitous blackouts. 250 Royal Marines were placed on the islands, but they would be replaced in time by the Scottish Rifles. There would remain, between the British troops and the locals, a relationship of respect, with the British promising to stay out of local affairs. Having said that, as there were six Swedish Navy ships among the islands at the time, the British had no choice but to take them to Orkney, fearing the Germans might get their hands on them. With the beginning of Iceland coming under Allied control, the British were eager to see how the bases in Icelandic territory could help them with their northern patrol, that is, those ships of the home fleet that had the numerous tasks of distantly blockading Germany, while stopping German warships from leaving the North Sea for the Atlantic, and from entering the North Sea from the Atlantic. Yet, when Germany defeated France, these same German subs were moved to the French coast, a body blow to the British plan to set a chokehold on the sea. Though Denmark fell in one day, the Battle of Norway was more prolonged, but it did not look good for the Allies. Thus, Churchill was focused on the situation to their northwest. On May 6th, Churchill told the War Cabinet that we can no longer talk to Iceland about putting these bases there because it is only a matter of time before the Germans find out and they will use the talks as an excuse to simply invade. No, Britain had to beat them to the punch. The War Cabinet agreed. Thus, the invasion force set out. But like the one that was sent to Norway, it was badly prepared. Few maps, they were not fully equipped, and no one of the group spoke any Icelandic language. Back on May 3rd, still 1940, the 2nd Royal Marine Battalion of Bisley, Surrey, was told to be ready to move out. The battalion was newly formed only the month before, and there were few weapons, and even less training with them. In all, about 750 men were going. The plan, if that's what it could be called, was to land at Reykjavik, arrest all the local Germans, secure the harbor, and then send troops to each major harbor or city. Operation Fork, as it was called, was on the way, with Colonel Robert Sturgis in command. As this was early in the war, the British troops were unpracticed in most things, 
gathering equipment, getting ready to move out, boarding a ship, or then transferring to another one. Thus the voyage was less than smooth. But at least the officers had the time to write up their assignments during the journey. When a British reconnaissance plane left the heavy cruiser HMS Berwick, this was spotted by everyone in Iceland, because Iceland only had one plane, and it never took off at night. And one of the spotters was the German consul, who drove back to his office and began burning all of his documents, and then he placed a call to the Icelandic foreign minister. This had happened early in the morning, but even earlier, at 3.40 a.m., a local policeman saw several warships approaching the harbor. Neutrality law said that only three vessels could enter at one time. Clearly, there were more than three coming this way. So the policeman called the foreign minister himself, got through, and was told, tell the British when they get here that they are violating Icelandic neutrality. Soon, coming at the policeman, a few of his mates, and some civilians, were 400 British troops. They disembarked without any major trouble. When the German consul was found, he was calm and reminded the officer in charge of arresting him that Iceland was a neutral country. To which the officer replied, Do you mean like how Denmark was neutral before you walked in on them? On May 10th, the Icelandic government officially protested that its neutrality had been violated. The British, again, replied with promises of compensation, favorable business partnerships, and the promise to leave just as soon as the war was over. But as the British were hard-pressed with the war, their troops there, even if they were barely trained and equipped, were needed elsewhere. So, on May 17th, some 4,000 men of the Canadian Army arrived. In time, there would be 25,000 troops, but that number was to repel a suspected German invasion, which never happened. With all this done, the British got to work, building or repairing airfields, harbors, roads, and other facilities. This would allow them to project power to protect the islands, but also the merchant ships going by taking supplies to the home island. One year into the occupation, May 1941, the U.S. got involved. Though still not technically in the war, Washington reached an agreement with Reykjavik that would see U.S. troops come to the islands, thus relieving the British troops. And after Pearl Harbor, the number of U.S. troops would reach 30,000 men. But again, that was to keep the Germans away. The U.S. agreed to send troops on June 16, 1941. Thus, the 1st Provisional Marine Brigade of 194 officers and 3,714 men departed from San Diego under the command of Brigadier General John Marston. But this would be a little sticky. Technically, Britain had not acquired permission from the alt thing for the U.S. troops to land. But on July 1st, the American task force was anchored off Reykjavik. FDR did not have time for these games, so he told the Marines to begin landing. Though the Icelanders would stay torn about the occupation, some called it the Blessed War, as there was no major destruction of property, and the servicemen spent freely, stimulating the local economy. And there was other extracurricular activities as well. During the war, 255 children were born, being the result of a local woman and a foreigner in uniform. The locals called these offspring the children of the situation. About 332 Icelandic women will go on to marry a foreign trooper. Of course, the great irony to all this is that Germany never really had a hard plan to invade Iceland. Oh yes, it would have been nice to Hitler's thinking of having Iceland under German control, to make sure the British did not get it, to using it as an airbase and harbor to operate again in the nearby waters. But again, this was wishful thinking. Still, a study was done in Berlin to see if taking Iceland was feasible. The answer was yes. It would have been called Operation Icarus, but the same report said that maintaining the supply lines to it would negate any benefits of controlling the island. This round went to the Allies. In June of 1944, Iceland declared itself a republic, 
though they still worked with the British, Canadian, and American troops. Not that they had much of a choice. Then the Keflavik Agreement was signed by Iceland and the U.S. that said the American army would leave within six months and the Icelanders would take control of the now-built-up Keflavik airport. But the Cold War came along, and the U.S. found that Iceland was still an important post. So a new agreement was reached in 1951 through NATO that said the U.S. would be responsible for defending Iceland for an unspecified period of time. In fact, the U.S. military would not leave Iceland until September 2006. About 250 miles or 402 kilometers northwest of Iceland is Greenland, another possession owned by the Danish, or at least it had been. But its story will veer from that of Iceland's, as the latter island was further south and closer to the convoy routes that were about to keep Great Britain from starving. Besides its location, Greenland can be very inhospitable, but making it worth the journey was its large cryolite deposit. Cryolite is an uncommon mineral that is used as a solvent in the process of refining aluminum, or aluminium. And as aluminum has one-third the density of steel, it is more pliable, and it's about to be used in many weapons and machines during this war. Because of the cryolite, Greenland was closed off to the rest of the world by Denmark before the war came. But then comes April 9, 1940, and Denmark is overrun by the Nazis. And like Iceland, Britain and Canada start to make plans to occupy the important parts of Greenland. But into the fray steps the United States. As this was a year and a half before Pearl Harbor, the U.S. is still neutral, but clearly FDR is on Churchill's side. Either way, the State Department declares third parties should keep their hands off Greenland, which is when the sheriffs or landsfogader, however you say that, or civil servants, and other representatives used a 1925 law which had an emergency clause, saying this law allowed the representatives to declare Greenland as a self-ruling territory, certainly as Denmark was no longer representing it. The Danish ambassador to the U.S., Henrik Kaufmann, helped the State Department, who also used the Monroe Doctrine as further justification of the U.S. getting involved in this matter in the first place. As Denmark itself was still running its own government, but clearly under the control of Berlin, Ambassador Kaufmann arranged it so he would continue representing the island to the U.S., However, Washington then said that the U.S. could not give diplomatic recognition or aid to Greenland unless it was independent. To wit, the sheriffs told the local parliament, Guess what? Congratulations. You're now independent. This satisfied the Americans. Oh, Denmark still sent instructions to Greenland and Iceland practically every day. They were just ignored. But the newly independent Greenlanders were not settled just yet. A large number of Norwegians were living in Canada, and the people of Greenland were thinking they might try to take us, so they went to the U.S. to ask for guidance. The Treasury Department said, oh, we'll help. They sent two U.S. Coast Guard vessels, the Comanche and Campbell, with supplies and a consular team on May 22, 1940. And though the world was in the middle of a war, there were diplomatic niceties or procedures to observe. First, the cryolite had to be guarded, but using American soldiers would not be good. That's not a good look for a neutral U.S. So someone had the brilliant idea of taking 15 Coast Guardsmen, get them to quit, put them in different clothes, give them back their guns, voila, they get to protect the mines. Oh, and the Coast Guard ships, before they left, dropped off their three-inch naval deck guns, their machine guns, and rifles with a lot of ammunition. Thus, the U.S. was neutral without really being neutral. But to have an active defense, some 15 hunters, men who had been on the island for years, were gathered up into the serious dog sled patrol. These men, with their knowledge and skills, not to mention the very nice rifles the Americans left behind, were ready to harass any Germans that showed up. 
Think of a smaller version of the opening phase of the Finnish War. As for the waters around Greenland, the British caught two Norwegian vessels from Europe and Americans caught a third. In response, the Norwegian stations on the East Coast were destroyed, further reducing the reasons for anyone to come to the island. Then came in the Lend-Lease Act. Now a major airfield for Greenland is needed. But to help keep things calm, the U.S. and Greenland government formalized the area as an American protectorate. This was formalized one year after Denmark had been occupied, and it allowed U.S. troops on the island. Yet the Germans were never far away, as their ships would come close to get an idea of the weather and send over a few reconnaissance planes from Norway. But all this was just a prelude to the U.S. coming into the war. After Pearl Harbor, the U.S. declared war on Germany on December 11th, and Greenland was right there beside them. Now the government officially separated from Copenhagen and more U.S. troops came ashore. Then came the war of the weather stations. As Germany needed to starve Britain, the weather around Greenland and Iceland were vital. Thus, Berlin secretly set up four weather stations on Greenland's east coast. The sled patrol found one station on March 11, 1943. The Germans there figured out that the jig was up, so they sought to capture the hunters before they could tell anyone. But the experienced men simply dropped everything and faded into the forest. They made their way back to Mr. Polson, the sledge patrol commander. But it must be remembered that the Germans were professional soldiers and more numerous. The sledge patrol's headquarters was attacked and burnt to the ground, but the entire defending team made a 400-mile trek back to another station without sleds, without food, without any provisions. The Germans could not keep up with them. As for the other stations, they were either bombed or attacked by Allied planes or the sled patrol, and the Germans gave up trying to hold these possessions. The U.S. troops stayed in Greenland until 1951, but in their place, Sears catalogs were flown in. This was America saying thank you. The people of Greenland and Iceland went on a shopping spree, bringing the modern appliances into their lives. But all this is getting ahead of the story. After both islands are safeguarded, there is still danger nearby. The following is FDR's speech to Congress a few months after the islands were safe in the early autumn of 1941. The destroyer USS Greer was delivering mail and other goods to the American troops on Iceland when she was attacked by a German sub, though technically the two countries were not at war. In this speech, the president confirms his shoot-on-sight order of September 11th. The war between the U.S. and Nazi Germany was warming up. Both sides were just waiting for some event to push them over the edge. My fellow Americans, the Navy Department of the United States has reported to me that on the morning of September 4th, the United States destroyer Greer, proceeding in full daylight toward Iceland, had reached a point southeast of Greenland. She was carrying American mail to Iceland. She was flying the American flag. Her identity as an American ship was unmistakable. She was then and there attacked by a submarine. Germany admits that it was a German submarine. The submarine deliberately fired a torpedo at the Greer, followed later by another torpedo attack. In spite of what Hitler's propaganda bureau has invented, and in spite of what any American obstructionist organization may prefer to believe, I tell you the blunt fact that the German submarine fired first upon this American destroyer without warning and with deliberate design to sink her. Our destroyer at the time was in waters which the government of the United States 
had declared to be waters of self-defense, surrounding outposts of American protection in the Atlantic. In the north of the Atlantic, outposts have been established by us in Iceland, in Greenland, in Labrador, and in Newfoundland. Through these waters the pass many ships of many flags. They bear food and other supplies to civilians, and they bear material of war for which the people of the United States are spending billions of dollars, and which, by congressional action, they have declared to be essential for the defense of our own land. The United States destroyer, when attacked, was proceeding on a legitimate mission. If the destroyer was visible to the submarine when the torpedo was fired, then the attack was a deliberate attempt by the Nazis to sink a clearly identified American warship. On the other hand, if the submarine was beneath the surface of the sea and with the aid of its listening devices fired in the direction of the sound of the American destroyer without even taking the trouble to learn its identity, as the official German communique would indicate, then the attack was even more outrageous for it indicates a policy of indiscriminate violence against any vessel sailing the seas, belligerent or non-belligerent. This was piracy, piracy legally and morally. It was not the first nor the last act of piracy which the Nazi government has committed against the American flag in this war. For attack has followed attack. A few months ago, an American flag merchant ship, the Robin Moore, was sunk by a Nazi submarine in the middle of the South Atlantic under circumstances violating long-established international law Violating every principle of humanity. The passengers and the crew were forced into open boats hundreds of miles from land in direct violation of international agreements signed by nearly all nations, including the government of Germany. No apology, no allegation of mistake, no offer of reparations has come from the Nazi government. In July 1941, nearly two months ago, an American battleship in North American waters was followed by a submarine which, which for a long time sought to maneuver itself into a position of attack upon the battleship. The periscope of the submarine was clearly seen no British or American submarines were within hundreds of miles of this spot at the time, so the nationality of the submarine is clear. Five days ago, a United States Navy ship on patrol picked up three survivors of an American-owned ship operating under the flag of our sister Republic of Panama the steamship Cessa. On August 17th, she had been first torpedoed without warning and then shelled near Greenland while carrying civilian supplies to, Ireland, to Iceland. It is feared that the other members of the crew have been drowned. In view of the established presence of German submarines in this vicinity, there can be no reasonable doubt as to the identity of the flag of the attacker. Five days ago, another United States merchant ship, the Steel Seafarer, was sunk by a German aircraft in the Red Sea 220 miles south of Suez. 
she was bound for an Egyptian port. So four of the vessels sunk or attacked flew the American flag and were clearly identifiable. Two of these ships were warships of the American Navy. In the fifth case, the vessel sunk clearly carried the flag of our sister republic of Panama. In the face of all this, we Americans are keeping our feet on the ground. Our type of democratic civilization has outgrown the thought of feeling compelled to fight some other nation by reason of any single piratical attack on one of our ships. We are not becoming hysterical or losing our sense of proportion. Therefore, what I am thinking and saying tonight does not relate to any isolated episode. Instead, we Americans are taking a long-range point of view in regard to certain fundamentals, a point of view in regard to a series of events on land and on sea, which must be considered as a whole, as a part of a world pattern. It would be unworthy of a great nation to exaggerate an isolated incident or to become inflamed by some one act of violence. But it would be inexcusable folly to minimize such incidents in the face of evidence which makes it clear that the incident is not isolated but is part of a general plan. The important truth is that these acts of international lawlessness are a manifestation of a design, a design that has been made clear to the American people for a long time. It is the Nazi design to abolish the freedom of the seas and to acquire absolute control and domination of these seas for themselves. For with control of the seas in their own hands, the way can obviously become clear for their next step, domination of the United States, domination of the Western Hemisphere by force of arms. Under Nazi control of the seas, no merchant ship of the United States or of any other American republic would be free to carry on any peaceful commerce except by the condescending grace of this foreign and tyrannical power. The Atlantic Ocean, which has been and which should always be a free and friendly highway for us, would then become a deadly menace to the commerce of the United States, to the coasts of the United States, and even to the inland cities of the United States. The Hitler government, in defiance of the laws of the sea, in defiance of the recognized rights of all other nations, has presumed to declare on paper that great areas of the seas, even including a vast expanse lying in the Western Hemisphere, are to be closed, and that no ships may enter them for any purpose except at peril of being sunk. Actually, they are sinking ships at will and without warning in widely separated areas, both within and far outside of these far-flung pretended zones. This Nazi attempt to seize control of the oceans is but a counterpart of the Nazi plots now being carried on throughout the Western Hemisphere all designed toward the same end. For Hitler's advanced guards, not only his avowed agents, but also, also his dupes among us have sought to make ready for him footholds, bridgeheads in the new world to be used as soon as he has gained control of the oceans. His intrigues, his plots, his machinations, his sabotage in this new world are all known to the government of the United States. Conspiracy 
has followed conspiracy. For example, last year a plot to seize the government of Uruguay was smashed by the prompt action of that country, which was supported in full by her American neighbors. A like plot was then hatching in Argentina, and that government has carefully and wisely blocked it at every point. More recently, an endeavor was made to subvert the government of Bolivia. And within the past few weeks, the discovery was made of secret air landing fields in Colombia, within easy range of the Panama Canal. I could multiply instance upon instance. To be ultimately successful in world mastery, Hitler knows that he must get control of the seas. He must first destroy the bridge of ships, which we are building across the Atlantic, and over which we shall continue to roll the implements of war to help destroy him, to destroy all his works in the end. He must wipe out our patrol on sea and in the air if he is to do it. He must silence the British Navy. I think it must be explained over and over again to people who like to think of the United States Navy as an invincible protection that this can be true only if the British Navy survives. And that, my friends, is simple arithmetic. For if the world outside of the Americas falls under Axis domination, the shipbuilding facilities which the Axis powers would then possess in all of Europe, in the British Isles, and in the Far East would be much greater than all the shipbuilding facilities and potentialities of all of the Americas not only greater, but two or three times greater, enough to win. Even if the United States threw all its resources into such a situation, seeking to double and even redouble the size of our Navy, the Axis powers in control of the rest of the world would have the manpower and the physical resources to outbuild us several times over. It is time for all Americans, Americans of all the Americas, to stop being deluded by the romantic notion that the Americas can go on living happily and peacefully in a Nazi-dominated world. Generation after generation, America has battled for the general policy of the freedom of the seas. And that policy is a very simple one but a basic, a fundamental one. It means that no nation has the right to make the broad oceans of the world at great distances from the actual theater of land war unsafe for the commerce of others. That has been our policy proved time and again in all of our history. Our policy is applied from the earliest days of the Republic and still applied not merely to the Atlantic, but to the Pacific and to all other oceans as well. Unrestricted submarine warfare in 1941 constitutes a defiance, an act of aggression against that historic American policy. It is now clear that Hitler has begun his campaign to control the seas by ruthless force and by wiping out every vestige of international law, every vestige of humanity. His intention has been made clear. The American people can have no further illusions about it. No tender whisperings of appeasers that Hitler is not interested in the Western Hemisphere. No soporific lullabies that a wide ocean protects us from him can long have any effect on the hard-headed, far-sighted, and realistic American people.
Because of these episodes, because of the movements and operations of German warships, and because of the clear, repeated proof that the present government of Germany has no respect for treaties or for international law, that it has no decent attitude toward neutral nations or human life, we Americans are now face to face, not with abstract theories, but with cruel, relentless facts. This attack on the Greer was no localized military operation in the North Atlantic. This was no mere episode in a struggle between two nations. This was one determined step toward creating a permanent world system based on force, on terror, and on murder. And I am sure that even now the Nazis are waiting waiting to see whether the United States will, by silence, give them the green light to go ahead on this path of destruction. The Nazi danger to our Western world has long ceased to be a mere possibility. The danger is here now, not only from a military enemy, but from an enemy of all law, all liberty, all morality, all religion. There has now come a time when you and I must see the cold, inexorable necessity of saying to these inhuman, unrestrained seekers of world conquest and permanent world domination by the sword, you seek to throw our children and our children's children into your form of terrorism and slavery. You have now attacked our own safety. You shall go no further. Normal practices of diplomacy, note writing, are of no possible use in dealing with international outlaws who sink our ships and kill our citizens. One peaceful nation after another has met disaster because each refused to look the Nazi danger squarely in the eye until it had actually had them by the throat. The United States will not make that fatal mistake. No act of violence, no act of intimidation will keep us from maintaining intact two bulwarks of American defense. First, our line of supply of material to the enemies of Hitler. And second, the freedom of our shipping on the high seas. No matter what it takes, no matter what it costs, we will keep open the line of legitimate commerce in these defensive waters of ours. We have sought no shooting war with Hitler. We do not seek it now. But neither do we want peace so much that we are willing to pay for it by permitting him to attack our naval and merchant ships while they are on legitimate business. I assume that the German leaders are not deeply concerned tonight or any other time by what we Americans or the American government says or publishes about them. We cannot bring about the downfall of Nazism by the use of long-range invective. But when you see a rattlesnake poised to strike, you do not wait until he is struck before you crush him. These Nazi submarines and raiders are the rattlesnakes of the Atlantic. They are a menace to the free pathways of the high seas. They are a challenge to our own sovereignty. They hammer at our most precious rights when they attack ships of the American flag, symbols of our independence, our freedom, our very life. 
It is clear to all Americans that the time has come when the Americas themselves must now be defended. A continuation of attacks in our own waters or in waters that could be used for further and greater attacks on us will inevitably weaken our American ability to repel Hitlerism. Do not let us be hair splitters. Let us not ask ourselves whether the Americas should begin to defend themselves after the first attack, or the fifth attack, or the tenth attack, or the twentieth attack. The time for active defense is now. Do not let us split hairs. Let us not say we will only defend ourselves if the torpedo succeeds in getting home or if the crew and the passengers are drowned. This is the time for prevention of attack. If submarines or raiders attack in distant waters, they can attack equally well within sight of our own shores. Their very presence in any waters which America deems vital to its defense constitutes an attack. In the waters which we deem necessary for our defense, American naval vessels and American planes will no longer wait until Axis submarines lurking under the water or Axis raiders on the surface of the sea strike their deadly blow first. Upon our naval and air patrol, now operating in large number over a vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean, falls the duty of maintaining the American policy of freedom of the seas now. That means, very simply, very clearly, that our patrolling vessels and planes protect all merchant ships. Not only American ships, but ships of any flag engaged in commerce in our defensive waters. They will protect them from submarines. They will protect them from surface raiders. This situation is not new. The second of the United States, John Adams, ordered the United States Navy to clean out European privateers and European ships of war which were infesting the Caribbean and South American waters, destroying American commerce. The third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, ordered the United States Navy to end the attacks being made upon American and other ships by the corsairs of the nations of North Africa. My obligation as president is historic. It is clear. Yes, it is inescapable. It is no act of war on our part when we decide to protect the seas that are vital to American defense. The aggression is not ours. Ours is solely defense. But let this warning be clear. From now on, if German or Italian vessels of war enter the waters, the protection of which is necessary for American defense, they do so at their own peril. The orders which I have given as Commander-in-Chief of the United States Army and Navy are to carry out that policy at once. The sole responsibility rests upon Germany. There will be no shooting unless Germany continues to seek it. That is my obvious duty in this crisis. That is the clear right of this sovereign nation. This is the only step possible. If we would keep tight the wall of defense which we are pledged to maintain, 
around this Western Hemisphere. I have no illusions about the gravity of this step. I have not taken it hurriedly or lightly. It is the result of months and months of constant thought and anxiety and prayer in the protection of your nation and mine it cannot be avoided the american people have faced other grave crises in their history with american courage with american resolution they will do no less today they know the actualities of the attacks upon us. They know the necessities of a bold defense against these attacks. They know that the times call for clear heads and fearless hearts. And with that inner strength that comes to a free people conscious of their duty, consciousness, conscious of the righteousness of what they do, they will, with divine help and guidance, stand their ground against this latest assault upon their democracy, their sovereignty, and their freedom. The Venture X card from Capital One gives you premium travel benefits, perfect for seeing Taylor Swift The Eras Tour. Presented by Capital One. Ooh, I do love her. Earn five times miles on flights and 10 times miles on hotels through Capital One Travel. Enjoy your stay in Suite 13. Whoa, 13? That's Taylor's lucky number. The Venture X card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details.